On October 14th, a group of people marched down Beirut, as happens in many other parts of the world. Suddenly, shots were fired and by the end of the day, seven people had died. This incident has led to a huge increase in tensions in Lebanon, with many even fearing that the sectarian war and conflict of the decades past might resume again. Why were these people marching? What was the nature of the tension? Let's talk about this in this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so uh, this protest, of course, was conducted by supporters of Hezbollah and Amal, the two parties associated with the Shias. The protest was about the Beirut blast probe. And after the shooting, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, gave a speech. Now, in this speech, he, of course, was very defiant. He said that, you know, there would be justice for his supporters who were killed. He uh, made statements specifically targeting Samir Jaja, the leader of the group called Lebanese Forces. So there's a lot of history to unpack around here. You know, what has led to these tensions? What is the background? But let's maybe first start with the current situation in Lebanon, which is going through a massive crisis. So could you maybe take us through the main factors or dimensions behind this crisis? As you know, Lebanon has been split around confessional lines, as it is called, which is basically each religious identities given a certain number of seats in parliament. So a kind of uh, organized, if you will, a state in which different religious identities get different numbers of parliamentary seats and share power in some form or the other. So you have the Baronite Christian section, you have the Shia sections, and you also have Sunni Arab sections. So these are the three major groups which have been there. We know there has earlier been a really civil war virtually between these groups. They share an uneasy uh, peace in which they jockey for powers in the parliament and in for president. At the moment, we have uh, Michel Aoun, who is the president of Lebanon. He's a Maronite Christian. But you also have other forces who have been trying to unseat a tacit alliance between Hezbollah and Michel Aoun and other sections who have come together for trying to give a kind of stability to Lebanon, which is not pro-Israel or pro-United States, which is where the fault lines also lie. So there is this uneasy peace seems to have been disturbed by two events. One is, of course, as we know, the ammonium nitrate uh, explosion which took place in uh, Beirut port. Now, this ammonium nitrate was stored there, very large amount of it, for almost seven years. And this is a known hazard. Therefore, given the fact that the Lebanese state was in a, some, some sense in a state of decay, the fact that this large explosion took place is not so surprising as it otherwise might be. Why was it stored there for so long? Knowing that it is a, is a huge hazard, destroyed parts of Beirut, killed a number of people. These are questions which is what the judge was probing. But unfortunately, there is also, again, a confessional element to this. Who do you blame? And the, it seems that the judge, like an earlier judge, was fo focusing more on Amal's representative in the ministries. And therefore, it appears that Amal and the Shia forces were being targeted. Amal and Hezbollah are in close alliance at the moment. And therefore, it was an indirect attack could be construed on Hezbollah itself. So the basic issue was that Amal and Hezbollah felt it was not an independent, impartial probe as it should be. They were much more under American pressure, Israeli pressure, and also Syrian pressure, which is the one for the last two to three years has been destroying the Lebanon's, uh, Lebanese state. Now, you know, Lebanon has been for a long time in a state of unstable equilibrium. It, as you have talked about, had civil wars earlier. But a part of this that everybody felt that we have to let Lebanon work in peace. And let us see how these forces within Lebanon can come and work out a peaceful alliance. Now, that has been disturbed for Israel with the belief that Hezbollah 
has become too powerful. It poses a certain threat to Israel. They tried to take Hezbollah out earlier occasions. Last one failed miserably. They could not proceed more than two to three uh, kilometers or miles beyond the Israeli border. Given Hezbollah's increased military strength, it does appear that the United States and Israel believe the destruction of Lebanon may be a better alternative. A failed Lebanon might be a better alternative than to have Hezbollah operating within the structure of the Lebanese state. And therefore the feeling that whether it's the Lebanese banks, whether the Lebanese financial institutions or the judicial institutions, they are actually operating at the a behest of other powers. How far this is true, we don't know. But it is also true that Saudi Arabia, United States, and of course Israel plays a huge role in Lebanese politics, just as Hezbollah, also supported by Syria today, and Iran play a role in Lebanese politics. So I think this is really the background of not just Lebanese fractures, but also the international forces which are in play in Lebanon at the moment. And I think if people don't realize that people don't come together, we might see a repeat of what we saw earlier. And that's the reason Hezbollah has pointed uh, the fing the, his finger at Sabir Jojo, who was very much a part of Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon. And that is the history which of course, Hezbollah remembers because that was a very bloody chapter in the history of Lebanon and of, of course Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon. Right, Praveen. So coming to that, in fact, it's interesting because uh, Hassan Nasrullah also pointed out that uh, the Lebanese forces led by Samir Jaja, they had actually probably, according to him, they worked with ISIS in Iraq while Hezbollah was the one protecting the Christians. So he was also trying to, in some senses, diffuse the clear sectarian element to it and also telling the Christian community that you know, Hezbollah looks after your interests as well. But coming back to the point that you were mentioning about the uh, the past, so to speak, where uh, the Lebanese forces, for instance, were backed by Israel, were backed by other regional powers as well. Could you maybe take us quickly through those time period and time periods and how they continue to have an implication today? You know, the Maronite Christians thought they are superior to the Arab Muslims, both Shias and Sunnis. And part of it was also they considered themselves some way uh, remnants of the Phoenicians who were in this part of the world. They also are very, very close to the Spanish colonial past. This is a long history where this, the, what are called the phalangists, and this is really descendants, political descendants of uh, phalangists in Europe, Nazi forces, uh, owed their allegiance to an ideology which was very similar and the belief that they are superior to the rest. And therefore they could, in southern Lebanon, wrest political power militarily. And there were internecine battles, killings. It is not that they were the only ones who were doing the killings. Bashir Jamal, of course, was the leader of the, this whole phalangist movement in which, of course, also we had Georgia sure. also as an important leader. There were other leaders, so they were not the only ones, of course, but the number of killings that took place were very large. Occupation of southern Lebanon by Israel started in 1985 and continued up to uh, 2000, a 15-year period, in which it was backed by southern Lebanese army, which was, of course, a completely uh, fascist formation working with, complete, with the, the Israeli forces, but also what is now called the Lebanese forces, but essentially the phalangist uh, movement, phalangist party. And that is led by Bashir Jamal, as I said, committed a huge number of atrocities. Again, no issue that it was only one-sided. It was not. But nevertheless, it was a sectarian battle in which the phalangist and openly fascist force aligned with Israeli armed forces against the Lebanese nation and against its own population. This is the history of Sabir Jojo. Uh, of course, there was after the ceasefire, after there was a peace agreement which was brokered partly by the Syrians, they all agreed that all these atrocities would be forgotten. Samir Georgia was not charged with these atrocities, but with planning to kill certain politicians, certain figures, in which, which was not covered by this amnesty, so to say, and that's why he served 11 years in jail. 
But after he came out, he also did say that he had repented. There were uh, statements he made expressing sor sorrow about all this internecine battles that had taken place, some kind of peace and reconciliation. But those who criticize George also say that he continues in the pharyngist for uh, formation, what is called the Lebanese forces. It's not the Lebanese armed forces. This is really a s outshoot of the uh, pharyngist A fascist parties, group, basically. Fascist group, essentially. And that, therefore, he has not changed his basic ideological position, unlike some of the other Christian leaders who had done so. So therefore, there is, there's always been a question about what Sabir Georgiou's positions are. And in this particular case, clearly, he wants the downfall of the Michel Aoun uh, presidentship. He wants this uh, the government, which has seen Amal and Hezbollah come together to uh, form a ministry, this to be dislodged. Therefore, the belief that he, this, this particular firing was trying to provoke, again, an internecine battle between the forces in uh, Lebanon, and therefore bringing back a kind of civil war which destroys the uh, Lebanese state. And here, it is interesting, Newland was there Victoria in Le Beirut that day, it has been charged that there had been also firings from the U.S. Embassy rooftops. No evidence who has done the firing as yet, but some indications that it might have been uh, Lebanese forces uh, people, because this is an area which has memories. And that memory is of the bus killings, where a number of uh, killings, people, Shias were killed. And this led to actually the sectarian war. So given the significance of that, this area, and the fact that it takes, takes place in an area where Georgia holds a certain degree of political power, the question, of course, is did he give the green signal or did this happen by forces that we still don't know uh, about? Or is it like what is called the Maidan firings, Asian provocators who want to destroy Lebanon actually firing from the rooftops. Right. So this is the really the question mark that remains today. Right. Prabir, and finally a question you uh, basically touched upon also in the first answer, which is the regional significance of Lebanon. So we knew, like you mentioned, Hezbollah, a key player in the region, an ally of Iran as well, vital in saving Syria from, uh, and Iraq for that matter, from IS forces. But Lebanon is also used in a very strategic way by Israel in violations of international law. So could you talk a bit about that as well? Well, that's an interesting question you raise because Lebanon is getting increasingly drawn into what Israel perceives as a battle between Israel, US-supported countries, and of course Iran right. and allies of Iran. So this has been the way it has framed itself. And given that, uh, Lebanon was earlier an easy target, but now that Hezbollah has a lot of rockets in its arsenal, and it seems to be quite sophisticated in the way it can use it, a direct attack on Lebanon is no longer feasible. What has happened is that Syrian war gives it a pretext of trying to hit at Iran's, uh, what it considers, assets in Syria, but essentially to destabilize Syria itself and bombard Assad and his forces. The idea is that if Syria can be kept boiling in a state of civil war, that weakens a possible alliance against Israel, which might encompass now Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And this, all of these countries have passed to different phases of war. They are now battle-hardened, unlike the forces that Israel faced earlier wars against the Arab countries. So given this, this is seen to be Israel a threat and therefore the need to keep Syria uh, under attack. And this is why what you talked about. If you see, therefore, the map in which you can see the attacks that have been launched against Syria, you will see they have been largely launched from Lebanese uh, yes. air force, air spaces. That is a very simple reason. If Israel launches for an air space, then Syria gets a reason to retaliate against Israel. If we launch it from Lebanese air airspace, who has launched it? Of course, everybody knows it's Israel. But what does Syria then do? And it also makes it much closer to Syria than if we launch it right. 
from uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. So for both these reasons, you will see number of airstrikes have been launched from Lebanon to Syria. Now, this, this part of it is what, of course, is also destabilizing the region. But Syria now armed with air anti-aircraft batteries of different kinds is able to take out a lot of those missiles. Right. In fact, in the last uh, salvo that was fired from Lebanese, armed, uh, Lebanese airspace, most of them seem to have been taken out by the uh, uh, whatever batteries now the Russians have given to the Syrians, and most of these missiles could not hit. So there is some e equality being established there as well. Which way it will go is not clear, but it is in Israel's interest to see that Syria is kept destabilized, and that's what we see in the way they want to play. Lebanon seems to be the short-term target is destroy Lebanon internally, destroy its economy, keep get back into an unstable equilibrium in which you have sectarian battles, and in Syria, keep the Syrian so president Bashar al-Assad defensive with certain some of these kind of airstrikes. That seems to be the Israel policy. And of course, we know the United States fully backing these policies. Right. Again, the question mark, can this kind of the attempts to keep people divided, keep people fighting each other, survive? That is a long-term question. I don't believe this, this kind of policies, destructive policies, help anybody. It can destroy certain countries, but at the same time, it does not bring back peace or security for Israel as well. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click as well as Mapping Fault Lines, where we will be covering geopolitical issues from across the world.